I'm Jill. I'm Victor. And we are building a board game. Welcome back to Build a Board Game, a series documenting the creation of a board game from start to finish. Last week, I covered the conception and planning phase. My friend showed me some great project management tools, like a work breakdown structure and Gantt charts. Already, a few things have changed since then. Firstly, Victor and I did a complete review of all the tasks on the Gantt chart. The dates you see here are a much more accurate estimate of when we think we can get things done. We've eliminated the entire month of January because that has come and gone. We also readjusted the priority level for certain blocks, namely graphic design. As you can see in the calendar, we've pushed all graphic design tasks into April and May since illustration is at a higher priority. I also added in a column for effort required. This tells us how light or heavy a task will be in terms of effort and number of hours. Certain things are super low effort and won't take more than an hour or two. Alternatively, high effort tasks will take multiple days, if not weeks. Doing this type of planning has been very helpful for me in particular, as I am still getting used to working from home. As a school teacher, I'm accustomed to regimented days that are dictated by strict schedules and bells on the hour. At home, it's a very different story. In order to mitigate the feeling of being stuck in a time warp, I decided to start bullet journaling again. This was my bullet journal back in 2021. I guess I need to edit that now. I used to be extremely precious and detailed with my journal. Often, making monthly spreads took more time than me actually using it in the day-to-day. -day. This time around, I am taking a much more practical approach. I have one monthly spread dedicated to habits such as eating a good breakfast and flossing before bed. The rest of the journal is meant for planning out daily tasks, which is very similar to what I would do in my teacher planner when I was still working. But enough about planning, because that was already covered in the previous video. This week, we'll be talking about gameplay. Now, gameplay has everything to do with a game's functionality. What's the end goal? How do you set up the board? What kind of components are involved, like dice, cards, and tokens? How do players take turns? All of those questions need answers, which comes with lots and lots of playtesting. Further down the road, once those answers start taking solid shape, a rulebook can begin to form. Now, I would love to share how our game works, but Victor pointed out that we don't own its copyright. Therefore, putting that information on the internet could be shooting ourselves in the foot, so to speak. In fact, did you know that gameplay itself can't actually be copyrighted? Imagine if a game like Snakes and Ladders tried to copyright rolling a die and moving your token forward. That would mean that every other game with that same mechanic would have to pay royalties to them, which makes no sense. The only time we can comfortably reveal those details about our game is once we have a complete product, later on in the manufacturing and marketing stages. What I can do is walk you through our process of playtesting, and how we went from a spark of an idea to a fully functioning game with its very own rulebook. The bare minimum you need to know is that our game has two types of characters, mages and meat shields, hence the title of our game. At the very beginning, Victor and I created boards that could accommodate two to eight players. We are well aware that these first boards of foam core and construction paper look pretty janky, but a game needs to be fun without any bells and whistles, so the jankier the better. Victor spent several weeks playing as multiple characters by himself, taking notes such as, how long does a game take on average? At the end of each game, how many points were the players able to accumulate? Which characters were more fun to play and which were kind of useless? Item cards were eventually added to the mix, which added another layer of complexity and even more questions. What's the card limit for hand size? 
Which cards are too powerful and therefore should only have one copy in the deck? Conversely, which cards could use more copies? From there, Victor would tweak both the characters and the item cards to bring a sense of balance. This was an ongoing process, and it still is. Now, in the summer of 2021, my sister and brother-in-law who live in Vancouver came all the way to Montreal for a visit. Luckily for us, they also love board games and were more than happy to play test with us. Finally, Vic could play with someone other than himself. We played multiple times during their stay, mainly whenever my baby niece was asleep. They gave honest opinions and a few suggestions, some of which were accepted and some of which were denied. Some of the questions we posed to make the feedback more targeted were, what made the game enjoyable? What aspects of the game were frustrating? And what could make it more enjoyable? This stage of beta testing carried on for about a year and a half with different groups of friends and family. Just like a lump of gold needs to be melted down over and over to remove impurities, a board game is refined through multiple playthroughs. If I had to guess, we've probably played the game close to 100 times up until now. At this stage, the time for major changes is over, and all that's left to do is tackle the minute details. The rules of gameplay are pretty well set, as well as the characters and item cards. To date, there have been 10 major iterations of characters and 4 of the cards. Any major changes were followed by several rounds of playtesting to see their effects. We also made sure to only make one change at a time so that we could clearly pinpoint its positive or negative impact. Whenever we playtest nowadays, we are looking for trends. Which items are always or never being used? Which characters are more popular than others? And are those characters always winning? In theory, we could play our board game a thousand times before deciding that there's nothing left to change. So how do we determine that the game has been refined to our satisfaction? Here are some of the personal requirements we came up with. The rules are clear and can be easily explained. Every character is fun to play. Item cards are well balanced in their quantity and individual effects and there are no strategies that will automatically guarantee a win or a loss. In order to figure out how to properly structure a rulebook, we did the obvious and looked at the games we already owned. The majority follow a pretty standard structure, all of which can be found in the table of contents. We separated ours into six basic sections. 1. The Overview this tends to be a short paragraph explaining the essence of the game. It sets the tone for what players can expect. 2. The objective. What is the win condition and what is the most direct way of getting there? 3. The contents. This is a list of all the components that players will find when they open the box, such as boards, cards, tokens, etc. The quantity of each should also be listed so that players know if they are missing anything. 4. The setup. What do players need to do before the game even starts? Perhaps this includes shuffling a deck of cards and dividing it evenly. Perhaps players must choose their color of token and which character they want to play. 5. How to play. This section is the most complicated and will most definitely be divided into subsections. It should explain how the game begins, how the turn order works, what are players' options once it's their turn, if and how other players can respond if it's not their turn, and how the game ends. The sixth and final section is appendices, which is a place where certain icons, symbols, or images can be explained in more detail. Of course, this type of information can be dispersed throughout the entire rulebook, but it's always handy to give it a designated section for quick and easy reference. Depending on the game, there can be more sections, but from what I've observed, the ones I've mentioned here are the bare minimum. On our Gantt chart, you can see that it's my responsibility to review the rulebook before we send it out to beta testers. Other than looking for spelling errors or sentences that don't make sense, 
Here are some other things to look out for. The language should be consistent. For example, there are parts in our rulebook where Victor and I use the words token and meeple interchangeably. For consistency's sake, we should really just choose one. Capitalizing or bolding keywords is also a good idea as it brings the reader's attention to the most important information. Specific examples should be given for more complex rules. This helps players decide what is in or out of bounds during more ambiguous gameplay. Key information is repeated several times. As an English teacher, I tell my students not to repeat themselves to avoid redundancy. However, a rule book is very different. There is absolutely no harm in repeating information that is essential to the game's functioning. If necessary, an FAQ section could be helpful for elaborating on specific mechanics that cannot be fully explained on cards due to lack of space. Next time, we're diving into character design. This is the part of the project that I look forward to with equal excitement and dread. Excitement because drawing is well within my wheelhouse. I really enjoy it, I have fun doing it, but I also have a lot of dread because I know it's going to be a ton of work. Join me next week to see how that goes. See you then.